Hey folks, Andy Patton here, Chet Holmgren and the Zags absolutely rolling right now, smoking the Cougars of BYU on Saturday for another huge victory. Today is Mailbag Monday, so plenty of talk about Holmgren and the upcoming NCAA tournament, all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. I want to thank all of you who make this podcast your first listen or your first watch of the day on YouTube. I really appreciate those of you who have made Locked On Zags a part of your routine. Great content continuing to come your way throughout the rest of the season. If you have not subscribed on YouTube yet, please go do so. Just go to youtube.com, search Locked On Zags, hit that subscribe button, trying to get to 500 before the end of March Madness. All right, happy Mailbag Monday. This is a reminder for most of you, but also for new listeners or people who have not participated in Mailbag Monday in the past. If you would like to get involved, very, very easy to do so. You can tweet at me at ScoreZagScore or at LockedOnZags whenever you are thinking of a question. Helps if you tag it Mailbag Monday. Either way, I'll probably write it up, put it in my notes, get it ready to go for Monday's show. You can also reach out to me via email at AndyPatton013 at gmail.com. That's a great way to ask multiple questions or ask a longer question that you would like to flesh out and you don't have enough room on Twitter. All right, we're just going to get right into it. Tons of questions today. I will say that people who ask questions about WCC stuff, there's five or six of them. A lot of great questions just didn't have room for them. So I'm going to bottle them all up and re- answer them on Wednesday's show. So if you don't hear your question answered, expect to hear it on Wednesday. All right, this first question comes from Darren Olson at HeavyDo44 on Twitter. He says, how does Chet's performance slash stat line from last night, this is Saturday, rank against some of the all-time single games in school history? I say top three for sure. So this is obviously extremely subjective. Uh, It's really hard not to love 20.17 rebounds, six assists, five blocks on the road in a rivalry game late in conference play. That is a pretty good, compelling argument to be one of the top three games of all time. For me, I don't think it could be top three because it was not a tournament game. I think the top three, top five performances of all time have to be tournament games or must, must win games. This was against an unranked, falling down BYU team. Not to say it was not incredibly impressive, but I don't think it's going to quite make my top three. I'd rather have like Sabonis versus Utah, that was such a huge monumental performance. It may not have been as statistically significant as this game, but he helped them win that game. Timmy versus USC last year, monster performance against the Trojans to help Gonzaga advance to the Final Four. Blake Stepp against Arizona, throwing it way back. Like There's just been a lot of really good individual performances in the NCAA tournament, and I would value any of those over a regular season game. In terms of regular season games, though, you could make a pretty strong argument that this game is up there. Wiltshire dropped over 40 points against Pacific. It's hard to not have that game near the top of the list. Obviously, Adam Morrison against Oklahoma State is an incredible individual performance. Joel Ayayi had a (laughs) triple-double. It's hard not to to talk about that, the only triple-double in school history. Uh, And then DeMontis Sabonis talked about him again in 2016. He had a game that where he led the team in points, rebounds, assists, and blocks. It was the last time that anybody that I saw could find that a team, that a player did this, which is what Chet Holmgren did on Saturday against BYU. Uh, Sabotas had 35 in that game. Uh, no disrespect to Chet, of course, he had a phenomenal game, but he had 20. So Sabonis leading the team in all of those categories while also dropping 35 is hard to ignore. Yes, it was not against as prolific of an opponent and not on the road at the Marriott Center. Again, all of that makes this a pretty subjective topic, but it's hard not to believe that that was one of the best individual performances uh, of the entire season, of Gonzaga's season, of the NCAA season, and a clear-cut reason why Chad Holmgren is 
a top two, top three pick in the NBA draft this upcoming year. Next up, this one comes from AU at Winnie Poop 0101 on Twitter. They say, seems like when Chet was on the bench, BYU went after Timmy and scored easily. How big of a concern will this be in the NCAA tournament if Chet gets into foul trouble? The depth is Anton and then who? Strother at the four? I love that more people besides me are bringing up Strother at the four because I feel sometimes like I'm shouting into the void when I bring up that potential lineup opportunity. Uh, I think the first thing to say to answer this question, it's really rare for Chet Holmgren to get into foul trouble. I'm not saying it's impossible for it to happen. It very obviously could happen. Uh, any big man is capable of getting into foul trouble, particularly if they're playing bigger, more physical opponents, which was probably what will happen in the NCAA tournament. But it's not like this is a, a big concern Chet is really good at using his body, using his arms in a way that prevents him from getting called for a lot of fouls. His length is just tremendous, and he can get away with still blocking and altering shots without committing fouls. But were it to happen, yeah, I think there would be a bit of a concern. One of the things that hurt Gonzaga last year was a lack of rim protection up front. I say hurt, you know, relatively speaking. They did not lose the game until the national championship game. But that is something that there could be an exposed weakness there if Chet were on the bench for extended periods of time. Drew Timmy and Anton Watson is a phenomenal front court, one of the best in the nation, and that's not even with Chet Holmgren in consideration, but it is not a rim-protecting front court. And the depth beyond those two guys, it probably, in my mind, if we're talking tournament, would be Julian playing the four and some three-guard lineups. Something like Nemhard, Hickman, Salas, or Nemhard, Bolton, Salas, Strother, and then Timmy or Watson at the five. I think that's a pretty good lineup, and I think it's still going to do a lot of good, and it's still a really, really good defensive lineup if Salas and Watson are both in the floor, on the floor, and Strother, who's a good defensive player as well. But yes, they're lacking rim protection. And I think we'd see that before we would see Ben Gregor, Caden Perry. I don't think those guys are going to play very many minutes in the NCAA tournament, if at all, barring obviously a, a blowout game where they may get in at that, at that point. But I do think that, Chet Holmgren needs to be able to avoid foul trouble in order for this team to, to play their best basketball for a full 40 minutes. Fortunately, we have a lot of history indicating that he's very, very good at avoiding foul trouble. Next question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, Drew Timmy was still in the game late against BYU. Was this likely to help him get his rhythm slash confidence? Against elite level teams, both Timmy and Holmgren having good games could be one of the critical keys to going deep in the tournament. It is possible the game against USF is a good example. Timmy had 23, Holmgren had 22. Timmy's stats over the last three games are far from alarming, 14.7-ish rebounds per game, but something seems off. Maybe it is skewed expectations after that superhuman game against Texas. Maybe this matters less than I think. This was also mentioned during the ESPN broadcast that Timmy has dialed back the stash celebrations. Yeah, I'm, I, it was weird that ESPN brought that up, to be honest. I think that's very strange. Uh, topic for them to be. I mean, I get that they have to fill time some capacity. I, Drew Timmy's still doing the mustache celebration. He wasn't doing it for a while. He got asked about it. He, I don't remember what his answer was. It wasn't anything very specific. Now he seems to be doing it more again. I, I do not care at all about whether he's doing the mustache celebration and whether that has any bearing on how he's feeling on the basketball court. I just, I don't think that it is any, it was really related to his confidence or his rhythm necessarily. I do think, I, I agree that he's looked a little bit off lately. I think most of it is just, it's the same conversations we were having about Chad Holmgren. Literally the exact same conversations. Beginning of the year, Drew Timmy was killing it. Most of the mailbag questions were, is, is everything okay with Chet? Is, is Chet okay? Now, the defenses have been so focused on stopping Drew Timmy because he's been torching everybody that Drew is taking less shots. He's slightly less e efficient because he's being swarmed defensively. And Chet Holmgren is going off. And now the questions are, are should we be concerned about Drew Timmy? They, no, I know you said that they can have good games. And yes, the USF game is a decent example, although Drew Timmy was terrible in the first half and really good in the second half. So it's not like they were both good at the same time for a full 40 minutes. This is not a concern to me, really. If Drew Timmy was missing way more shots, then yeah, I could see a little bit of a concern. And yes, he's had some games where he missed a lot more shots than usual. And that is a little bit alarming. Like uh, maybe raise a little bit of an eyebrow looking at that. But ultimately... Defenses have to figure out how to guard these guys. And right now, a lot of defenses are trying really hard to commit to guarding one of them, and the other one is just going off. That's kind of all that it is. Chad Holmgren had two points against Texas. Drew Timmy had 37. In, the, in most, some of the most recent games, Chad has been over 20 points in basically every game recently. Drew Timmy had, I think, eight against LMU. 
if Gonzaga were losing games or not performing up to their offensive expectations, I would be more concerned. As it stands, this is a team sport. These guys are really, really good at being good teammates. That's what it's a hallmark of Mark Few and their staff and what they do. So a few guys not scoring at their normal potential when Gonzaga is still blowing out good teams doesn't have me concern. Last question for the first segment here comes from Jim on Facebook. He says, Mark Few seemed pretty upset with Chet near the end of the first half. Could it be that he's taking too many threes? Why don't I let Chet Holmgren tell you why he was why Mark Few was upset with him at the end of the first half. I tweeted, for those of you who watched this game, uh, Molly McGrath was interviewing Mark Few at the end of the half, uh, talked about Chet Holmgren and how well he's playing. Mark Few basically <laughs> criticized Chet Holmgren's last couple of minutes uh, in the first half. It was immediately negative. Uh, and I tweeted, Mark Few criticizing Chet Holmgren's decision-making when he has a first-half double-double is peak Mark Few, which it is because Mark Few is, tends to focus on the negative things rather than the positive things. And I was just kind of making a joke on Twitter after the game. Chet Holmgren responded to the tweet and said, as he should, three turnover in two minutes can't happen. I love this. I love this so much. Chet Holmgren taking immediate responsibility. He didn't have to do this. He wasn't even tagged in the tweet. He just wanted to respond to it. Kudos to him. Uh, and yeah, he committed a couple of turnovers, made some boneheaded mistakes at the end of the half. Uh, BYU hit a couple of threes, brought the brought the score a little bit closer, ultimately did not matter, and not that we expected it to. But in, in other games, that could matter. Letting a team hit back-to-back -back threes in the last minute of a first half is absolutely the kind of thing that could haunt you down the stretch of a close game in the NCAA tournament. And a freshman big like Chet making a couple careless mistakes because he'd been rolling and the team has been playing really well and it's fun to shut up the crowd and all that stuff and he just got a little ahead of himself, made a few mistakes. It's not the end of the world, but Mark Few justifiably had something to say about it and Chet took it like a man, said, hey, I made a mistake, acknowledged it, that's the kind of thing you want to see from your best player. You want to see him be a leader. You want to see him take accountability for his mistakes. You want to see Mark Few call them out the way that he did. I think all of this went really, really well. And I was happy to see the response from Chet. I think that it's it's going to make this team better in March. All right, we got more listener submitted questions coming your way in the second segment. Before we get there, though, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. There might be less football being played, but betonline.net has way more stuff to bet on this playoff season. From scores, totals, and player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline is the number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. And it's not just football. BetOnline.net's basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC odds coverage is the best in the business. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, BetOnline is your number one online wagering destination. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports and play your favorite games. All right, folks, Andy Patton here to introduce our new sponsor, Homefield. Homefield is a premium collegiate apparel brand out of Indianapolis, offering incredibly comfortable, officially licensed apparel with vintage college designs. If you guys missed this, they launched their Gonzaga line in week two of their big new Saturday season three. It came out on January 29th. It was all over Twitter. Everybody was talking about it. And for good reason, the Zags collection has 14 pieces of apparel, including t-shirts, hoodies, crewnecks. It's all vintage stuff. The designs are incredible. We got Captain Zag, Teddy Gonzaga, a shirt that says true blue and white, defend the kennel t-shirt, legitimately some of the coolest Gonzaga gear that exists out there. This material is also insanely comfortable. It fits well. It's unique. It's not just like every other Gonzaga gear that you see out there. This is can't miss Gonzaga gear. You need to get this before March Madness. Fortunately, new customers can get 15% off their first purchase from Homefield with the code LOCKEDONZAGS at checkout. Go to homefieldapparel.com, check out their Gonzaga line. You'll want to buy all 14 pieces if you can, and you can use promo code LOCKEDONZAGS for 15% off. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags, still answering listener-submitted questions for Mailbag Monday. It is Super Week, which is brought to you by Get Upside, and there's no better place to get coverage of the big game than the Locked On NFL podcast. Locked on Bengals and Locked on Rams are in LA all week covering the big game. All right, this next question comes from Dad Risk via Twitter. He says, it would have felt like blasphemy a month ago to ask this, 
but is this team better than last year's? If the three-point shooting is real, then there's a case to be made, I think. Suggs and Kispert were so dang good, though, but this Chet guy ain't bad either. Tough call. Yeah, I think I think this team is probably not quite as good offensively. They're just a little bit less well-rounded. And again, it's not that this team is bad offensively. I mean, Christ, how many times have they scored over 100 points this year? But last year's team was so consistent, so dynamic offensively. This team has a little bit less playmaking because Jalen Suggs was such a ridiculous playmaker. Uh, This team's less consistent as an outside shooting team. Obviously, their outside shooting recently has been capital E elite, unbelievable to see how they've been shooting recently, but they don't have as much consistency. They don't have a true knockdown, you know, just put it on the board outside shooter the way that Corey Kispert was uh, uh, on last year's team. So they're a little bit weaker in that regard, but defensively they're way better. And last year's team was really good defensively. Jalen Suggs was an elite perimeter defensive player. He was so, so good, but last year's team could not protect the rim. They were not good at it. Corey Kispert was the team's primary four. Drew Timmy was, of course, the five. Anton Watson played a lot of minutes at the four or five as well, but none of those guys are rim protectors. That's just not their role. This year, the lineups with Chet Holmgren and Anton Watson are so – nobody can score on them. They're so good defensively as perimeter defensive players, as low post defensive players. Obviously, Chet's an elite shot blocker. You have a player like Hunter Salas coming off the bench who absolutely wreaks havoc – in the passing lane, plays incredible defense on that end of the floor. I think Rasir Bolton is an upgrade, def- maybe not defensively, but definitely offensively over Aaron Cook, and at least defensively he's comparable as well. The way Chet's shooting right now, the way this team is playing in general, I think this team is better, but it is very, very close. Uh, offensively, I think it's really close. Defensively, I think you got to lean with this year's squad. Dad Risk is not the only person with this thought in mind, though. Another question, this one comes from Pace and Space Jam, who says, could it be that this year's team has a higher ceiling than last year, but last year's team had a higher floor? Well, I mean, <laughs> last year, the, the only higher ceiling than what last year's team had is winning it all. And I think last year's team had the potential to win it all. Like their ceiling last year was winning the national championship. They fell just short of their ceiling, but that was kind of what their ceiling was. This year's team obviously has the same ceiling. It's very clear the way that Gonzaga is playing right now that they can win the national championship. I don't know how you could watch this team and not think that they're capable of winning at all, but I think last year's team did too. So I don't know that you can say this year's team has a higher ceiling because last year's team was the heavy favorite to win it all for the majority of the year, which is about as high of a ceiling as you can get. In terms of the floor argument, I do think I get I get the argument there. Last year's team seemed so destined to at least make it to the final four. They were so good, so well-rounded. This year's team, I think, is similar. We've seen some warts from this team. Obviously, we saw struggles against teams like Tarleton State, even Mary Mack. They struggled a little bit, lost to Alabama, who now doesn't look like that great of a team, lost to Duke, which is not that terrible of a loss. Duke is obviously very, very good. But I, I think it's more, it's less about, those losses and those struggles being a part of this team's floor more so that it's just that last year's team peaked right away. Like they were good from the tip. This year's team was going to be a growth experiment. And Mark few kept talking about, he kept telling us this all year. He kept saying, Hey, this team's going to get better. We're young. We have a lot of new pieces. I'm missing my associate head coach. So I'm still figuring out some new things here. Chet, you know, Chet and, and um, Salas and Nolan Hickman are all new to the team. Receiver Bolton's new to the team. You know, Watson's taking on a different role. Nembhard's taking on a different role. Like there's a lot of moving parts. But now the way that this team's playing right now, the the peak that we have hit right now is better than last year's team. Last year's team was just better from start to finish or almost finish, I suppose. But this year's team, I think, is just the the path is just different. I don't know necessarily that comparing them straight away is, is a very fruitful endeavor necessarily, but I think it's clear that the path that these two teams are taking to get to where they're going to end up is just very, very different because of the personnel. All right, next question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, Mark Few seems to be expanding the rotation to include Hickman and Salas. Could this be an eight-player rotation for the remainder of the conference schedule? If it works, which it seems to be, could we see this in the big dance as well? Yeah, I think it's always kind of been an eight-man rotation. There have been a few games here and there where Hunter Salas played less than 10 minutes. Obviously, very early in the year, he was playing not very much. 
uh, as he was kind of getting accustomed to the collegiate game. But for the most part, it has been an eight-man rotation all season long. Uh, of course, Gonzaga always expands the rotation a little bit when they're playing some of the bottom feeders of the WCC. You know, we'll see eight to ten minutes of Ben Gregg here and there. We'll see more of Martinez Arlauskas, Matthew Lang, guys like that. And that's not really a, a byproduct of the expanded rotation as much as it's just emptying the bench and giving some of the starters some rest. But I think I think the eight that Gonzaga's playing right now, the five starters alongside Hickman, Salas, and Anton Watson, I think that's going to be pretty consistent from here on out. I'd be pretty surprised if we saw very many more games this year where Hunter Salas isn't playing 15 minutes per night. Uh, you know, and, and obviously everybody in that rotation plays 15 or more minutes per night. In the big dance, I think so too. I think, I think Hunter Salas is going to play in March. I wasn't as confident about that earlier in the year, but I feel pretty confident about it now. I think he's he offers such versatility defensively. He's so long. He's so athletic. He's improving dramatically as an offensive player. He moves extremely well without the basketball. The outside shot isn't really there, but they don't need him to do that. I think he's going to be a part of the of the he's going to be a piece of the puzzle when this team gets into March. All right, last question for this segment comes from Jimmy Brown at J Brown Buzz City on Twitter who says if the Zags were down two with 10 seconds to play, are they playing through Timmy for overtime? Or if they're going for three, what's the hierarchy of who's shooting it? Yeah, obviously it depends on the opposing team and kind of the momentum swings and how Gonzaga has been shooting it. There's a lot of factors here. I think that's a kind of a cop-out answer and fairly obvious one. But I think for the most part, I think Gonzaga would probably go for two to try to tie the game. I think that's generally what Mark Few's kind of philosophy is, their strategy. When you have a player like Drew Timmy who shoots so well, uh, on two pointers, you kind of have to go through them. You know, if they're playing Auburn and Walker Kessler's got, you know, only got one or two fouls and has blocked six shots, then maybe they don't go to Drew Timmy in that situation. Maybe they look for something else. But if they're playing other teams where Drew Tim Drew has had a good game, I think they're going to most likely go to him. If they're looking for three, I think that at this point you might actually go to Chet first, which I know is seems counterintuitive to Mark Few's philosophy of trusting a freshman with some with a responsibility that big. But obviously Jalen Suggs took the big shot last year, not not off a set designed play necessarily, but still Mark Few was was perfectly accepting of Jalen Suggs taking that shot. Uh, granted, going into overtime would have been the worst case scenario there. But still, I think Chet's probably your top choice. After that, I think you go Bolton, uh, you know, grad transfer, older guy, veteran, really good three-point shooter. Strother's probably third on that list in terms of hierarchy, although it could be Nembhard as well, just because of his kind of veteran presence and experience. But I think the best option if the Zags are down two is to try to get the ball to Drew Timmy uh, to get him to get a, a shot around the rim. All right, two segments down. Coming up, we're going to answer even more listener submitted questions. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. It's the new year, so that means new year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you'll want to eat it, unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy. You want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring. By now, you might be thinking, this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? But Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, here's an idea for the new year. Go to all your secret treat stashes at home, in the pantry, at the office, in the car, wherever. Throw out all of the sugary or calorie filled treats and replace them with Built Bars. So when you're craving a snack or a treat, you can reach for something that's healthy and tastes incredible. Even if you're not a huge fan of working out, you can at least eat something that tastes good and is good for you. Go to BuiltBar.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your next order. Promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still answering listener-submitted questions all episode long for Mailbag Monday. This next question comes from Larry via Gmail. Larry says, there are a bunch of teams that could be in the West Regional that have the size, defense, and shooting to end the Zag season. Here are the ones I think are in that group. Arizona, UCLA, USC, Baylor, Kansas, Texas Tech, and one of the Big Ten top three, which are Illinois, Wisconsin, or Purdue. He said, if you want to include three to four SEC teams, you can as well. Which team or two have the best chance of derailing a Final Four appearance? Yeah, I don't think this many teams are really realistic options to beat Gonzaga, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I did a segment last week. I believe it was on Tuesday's episode and Wednesday's episode 
where I was discussing teams that I think that have a realistic chance of defeating Gonzaga if everything goes well. A lot of these teams that were that were listed here are on that list, including Auburn, including Purdue, including Kentucky, including Baylor, including Kansas. All of those teams were discussed last week. So if you have not checked out those episodes, highly recommend them. It's a good look at those teams. Uh, Arizona was in there as well, but I think in terms of realistic teams that could be in the West region and defeat Gonzaga before the Final Four, Arizona is probably the best bet. I think at this point, Arizona is borderline locked in to being the number two seed in the West if they are not a number one overall seed. I think it's going to be one of those two things. Are they going to be a number one seed or they're going to be the number two seed in the West? They have supplanted UCLA now that UCLA lost to Arizona State. Huge loss for the Bruins, I think. There's a pretty good chance the Bruins are not in the West region. They're either a number two seed somewhere else or maybe even a number three seed in the West region. USC uh, is the other kind of top tier Pac-12 or West Coast team. I'm not worried about USC at all. I just don't think that they're that good, to be honest. They haven't played a great schedule. They lost to Stanford twice. Uh, Isaiah Mobley is a good young player, but he's not good enough to really move the needle too much for for USC. Uh, UCLA doesn't really worry me all that much. Obviously, they're a better team with Cody Riley healthy than they were when Gonzaga played them when he was not healthy, but I'm still not super concerned about them. The rest of the teams here listed that, that I haven't already talked about, none of them really worry me. Wisconsin's been pretty rough lately. Texas Tech, Gonzaga's already beaten, and they're pretty bad offensively, so I'd, I'm not super, I don't think they're going to score enough points to beat Gonzaga. Uh, Illinois relies too much on post scoring, which is hard against a team that has such good post defense like Chet Holmgren provides for them. So no, I don't think a lot of these teams are serious threats. Um, again, Auburn, Purdue, and Kentucky were all mentioned, but they're not going to be in the West region. <laughs> they're almost certainly going to be either one seeds or they're going to be two seeds somewhere else. I just, I don't think I'd be pretty surprised if Kentucky ended up as like the number two seed in the West region. That would be a surprising result to me. If it did happen, then yeah, I talked about Kentucky. They're a team that has is a bit of a threat, but ultimately, I think Gonzaga, Arizona is the biggest threat to Gonzaga's path to get all the way to the Final Four. Next question comes from Havila Benjamin on Twitter, who says, "What eight nine seed range team does Gonzaga want not want to draw in a round of thirty two matchup? What are the teams in that range that present matchup problems?" Yeah, I looked through Lenardi's bracket and I looked through Lucas Harkin's bracketology report for the Heat Check College Basketball site, looked at a couple other ones, kind of all the teams in the 7 to 10 range who I think realistically could end up being on the 8-9 line. There's not a lot of teams that really worry me. Gonzaga's really, really good. I don't think there's a lot of 8-9 teams that are going to threaten them the way that uh, there have been in years past. Uh, Murray State is one that scares me a little bit. Murray State's really, really good. Mid-major teams te- tend to almost always get underseeded. Murray State probably deserves to be like a six or a five. They're probably going to get an eight or a nine because the committee hates mid-major teams. So they would be a bit scary. Boise State is currently listed on the nine line right now. They scare me a bit. They're great defensively, like one of the best defensive teams in the entire country. They're well coached and their coach, Leon Rice, was an assistant at Gonzaga for a long time. So he knows Mark Few really, really well. So that's another team that I think well, they, they could present some problems. I don't think they have the horses to beat Gonzaga, but they could make the game a little bit ugly. And then I, I want to shout out Oregon. Oregon's not currently projected in that in the tournament right now, but I think that there's a they're playing well. They're playing good basketball right now. If they continue to win out, they're the kind of team that could sneak in as the number is the fifth team in the Pac-12, maybe even get an eight nine line. Uh, they got some size. Their their big men haven't been playing all that great lately, but Nafale Dante is very good when he's healthy. Will Richardson's a really good young guard. They're not young. He's a senior, but a really good guard. I think they're the kind of team that that could be a nine seed that ends up upsetting or challenging a one seed, although I don't think they match up extremely well with Gonzaga. All right, and final question of the show comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, the gender gap has come up in sports and entertainment, but is also seen in many other professions. Vandersloot's stand is an important one in that it addresses a pay gap that has periodically been addressed but never solved. It'd be great to discuss this further. Uh, one thing I want to say, I don't know if Courtney is like taking a, a big stand to address the pay gap. Uh, she's She wants more money because she feels she's entitled to more money. I don't want to hold her up as a martyr for women's pay equality conversation if that's not a conversation that she's trying to have herself, if that makes sense. Like if she wants to champion it, hell yeah, we support her. I would love to talk about it more, but I don't want to like put her on that pedestal if she's just having trying to have a negotiation with her team. Um, beyond that, I do plan to discuss this topic 
much more in a future episode. I'm going to leave it at that because I'm waiting to get some information about the potential guests that I have lined up to talk about this topic. Uh, so I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. So it's a bit of a non-answer right now, but I promise that I do want to come back to this topic and explore it at length with somebody who's very, very educated on the topic. With that, we are done for today. Mailbag Monday in the books. We got plenty to discuss for the rest of this week. A couple more Zag games on the schedule. All right here on the Locked on Zags podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. Podcast links will be available on Twitter at Locked on Zags and on my own Twitter account at Score Zags Score. Finally, thank you again to those of you who've made this podcast your first listen of the day. Now is a great time to make your second listen of the day, the Locked on Bets podcast. Locked on Bets is your daily one-stop shop for all of your sports gambling needs. Locked on Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags!